So CNBC Beijing bureau chief Eunice Yun released a video titled How BYD, NIO and other Chinese EVs compared to Tesla. This video, in my opinion, is a good example of the tightest spaces that Chinese EV companies have to maneuver when they would like some airtime on US TV. Yet at the same time, they know that these journalists will probably misreport and make sure that their brand looks as bad as possible at any chance they get. Hello, my name is Fernando Munoz and welcome to my channel. Just a reminder that this content is created also in Spanish. So if you want to share with somebody who doesn't understand the language, click the link in the title of this video. Thank you very much. So let's talk about a couple of things that I noticed in kind of like a chronological order. Uh, at the start of the clip around the 10 minute and also at the 10 minute, she asked Xiaopang to park the car illegally in a place where there are no lines on the ground. Um, as I said, because this is a chronological video, we'll talk about that later because they talk about it on the 10th minute, but also at the beginning is their entry introduction to their video. Now, before the first media, the first minute of the video is over, they start repeating this US Commerce Department's claim of Chinese overproduction. They mentioned that Chinese NEVs are entering markets worldwide, which is great. But um, they also ignored the fact that Chinese consumers are buying more NEVs than the rest of the world combined. So where is the indication of overproduction? Is there an oversupply? If there is an oversupply, why are they waiting lists for almost every NEV model in China? Model 3 wait times, 3 to 5 weeks for all versions. Model Y wait times, around 1 to 3 weeks. From April 2024, the information about ET5 from NEO, the wait time is 2 to 3 weeks. And other models from NEO, customers are required to wait about 5 weeks. So if there are waiting times, Where's the overproduction? Now, it's true that subsidies can also create overproduction, but we're going to touch about this later because they touch on it later as well. Okay. So continuing with their video, they, the narrator, the journalist, they characterize Chinese NEV manufacturing as benefiting from cheap labor. I wonder if these people have ever been inside a BYD or a Neo factory. I'll tell you what, I have had the privilege and while I'm not allowed to film and show you, I can tell you what cheap labor actually means. It means robots, robots and robots and ro countless robots that the U.S. lacks. According to the latest World Robotics report from the International Federation of Robotics, a record 553,000 industrial robots were installed last year, which brings the global operational stock to 3.9 million by the end of 2022. The interesting fact is that China alone accounts for more than half of these new installations, which makes it then the world's largest market for robots by far. Now, the journalists also claim that China's EV manufacturers benefit from cheap materials. Now, this is this this is close to home because I think this is a veiled reference to aluminum or aluminium <laughs> that is used in most cars chassis, which the US, without proof, alleges that originates from Xinjiang and is produced using forced labor. This is this is just not true. This is false. The aluminium of aluminum is simply locally sourced and that's what makes it cheaper. Please refer to my report on the Uyghur Forced Labor Pre Prevention Act, uh, the UFLPA, um, in the link in the description for more details about that. I do know for sure that this is not so. Now, regarding government subsidies, the U.S. has implemented both the CHIPS Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, both of which provide support that far exceeds what China has ever offered. And we're going to see why I say that in a moment. A rough estimate of U.S. government spending on NEV subsidies in the last 10 years puts it around 100 billion U.S. dollars. Yet the U.S. hasn't much to show for all that investment. Janet Yellen admittedly, uh, without being too happy about it, during an interview with Marketplace on May 9th of 2024. There's also a report by Bloomberg who reported that Chinese subsidies 
have been dying down, have been dialed down after, well, these factories achieving production efficiencies that allow them to not depend on those. And let us not forget one very important fact is that Tesla was the largest recipient of Chinese government subsidies at one point. Now, here's another well-known fact that is ignored conveniently by Mrs. Yun is that a substantial portion of Chinese subsidies was directed in response to the mandate from Beijing to electrify public transportation in the mid-2015, the 2010, sorry, around 2015. This policy simultaneously stimulated demand and supply for EV charging infrastructure. It helped the country to overcome the primary hurdle to widespread electric vehicle adoption, which is why people were able to just go and buy private electric vehicles. There are charges around, so you don't have to worry about that. Now, with regards to the comparison that they make, the car selection, in my opinion, is questionable. To compare directly these vehicles is wrong. It's wrong because they vary so much in their price points. This is a concern, particularly uh, at the end of the video when the lady concludes and claims that Chinese cars are inferior to Tesla. When I was in the Model Y, you could have pretty good control in the car. And that wasn't really the case on the whole for the cars that we were in that were from the Chinese EV maker. For example, in one of the cars that I was in, the, the steering wheel was kind of off compared to where I'd be sitting. There's one car that I was in that had really nice leather chairs, but the way that the chairs moved, it's, when you're driving, it's just squeaking the entire time. For me, look, the problem is that when she talks about the issues that they had with some of the cars, they don't tell us which cars they were. Was it the cheapest car? Was it the oldest car? Was it the highest mileage vehicle? They don't tell us. Now, the criticisms that they give also are rather subjective. For the cars that we were in that were from the Chinese EV makers, you didn't have that same level of um, precision when you were making a turn, for example. The reviewer kind of struggles to articulate her thoughts and in the end ends up citing Oh, imprecise handling and the squeaky leather seat, which very conveniently, as you know, never shown in the video. I'm just saying. So this raises questions about the overall condition of the cars that she drove. Is it possible that these were just previously abused <laughs> test drive vehicles, you know, drive it like it's stolen? Um, there's a fact that I want to mention. This is publicly available information. If you type any car license plate, is going to tell you that in this particular case, the NEOS license plate has a parking violation from 2022, as you can see here, which indicates that this is at least a, uh, a two-year-old car. It's not a brand new car. Now, why do I say this? Because uh, if you use the newest cars, you get the best experience. But anyway. Let us move on. Um, around the third minute in the video, yeah, the narrator intentionally uses the word cheaply to describe BYD's car manufacturing and you know how I am about language. Well, often we associate cheap with low quality. It is true that cheap can also imply affordability. And the fact is that BYD's competitive car production is facilitated by its vertical integration strategy. That's what enables them cost management and potential lower prices to customers. Now, the narrator overlooks the fact that BYD was actually compelled to produce many car parts in-house due to early supply chain restrictions that were imposed by their competitors. They just wouldn't sell them the parts. So, okay, you don't sell me, I'll make them at home. Through their development, they have been forced to start designing and engineering and making parts for their cars when competitors decided not to sell to them. They now make suspensions, gearboxes, motors, braking systems, and so many other parts for their cars. It's very similar to Huawei's resilience in overcoming unfair sanctions on their chips. You don't sell me? Okay, I'll figure it out. I'll make my own. This is why BYD ended up innovating and patenting thousands and thousands of self-produced components. Now, on BYD's battery expertise, they've been making batteries for decades, even when they, when 
I think that they started making mobile phone batteries. I remember visiting their factory and there is a Nokia 3010 or 3310, I forgot the name of the model. That's how long they've been making uh, batteries. But then they moved on into making batteries for public transportation. And this is where it's important to understand a few things. The Chinese government subsidies were directed at BYD around 2018, 2017. They were about $3.2 billion, as Ms. Yun points out correctly, but they primarily focus at developing electric public transportation, not private cars. As I mentioned before, this Chinese policy spurred both demand and supply for EV infrastructure. This is what helped them to resolve a critical obstacle to private EV adoption in the country. So it was a subsidy that went to BYD, but in the end, it was a subsidy to the whole infrastructure of the country, to the whole plan of electrifying the, the country's fleet, and uh, it paid out. It just really, really successful model. The entire ecosystem, as well as the government, built up a very good environment for apply the new energy vehicle for the energy storage, for example, battery swapping, battery charging, all the infrastructure make this happen. And of course, the industry itself, our OEMs, our supply chains, also support such fast growth compared to the other market around the world. Now, regarding Mrs. Yun's Neo EC6 battery swapping experience, and I, I, this one again is close to home because you all know that I drive a Neo. I need to clarify that she was using a first generation swapping station, not the more advanced four generation model. Why did she choose that? Hmm, I don't know. Not even the third generation, which is also really good. But, but she f went for the first one. I know because there were no parking song lines at the front of the, of the swapping station. So it's definitely a first generation. Also, the lifts that they show in the video, those are first generation lifts. Um, additionally, there's something else that I picked up is the AI, Nomi, says in Chinese that there is a two-person queue ahead of her. Well, they say three minutes. My experience was about a little under 10. So she's got to wait until those people are done. Now, given these factors, her complaint about a nearly 10 minute swap time is questionable. Notably, I have to mention one thing that is extremely, extremely relevant. When you swap battery at a first generation station, you cannot park the car yourself. You actually are required to transfer your car to a NEO employee who's going to park it for you. Why doesn't she mention this? When she doesn't say these things, it raises questions about why the omission. I don't know. You let me know in the comments if you think that these omissions were intentional. Now, on to um, Ms. Yun's attempt to use the auto parking feature of the Xiaopang Xpeng, which cannot be qualified other than a failure. Yes, that was not a good experience. It didn't work, basically. However, as an experienced driver here in the country, nearly two decades driving here, there are several things that I would like to point out. Number one, the chosen parking location was unconventional. It, it, it didn't have the designated parking spaces that are typically marked with painted boxes on the ground. These markings are crucial for the car systems, the cameras and whatnot to to determine the type of parking that it is. Is it parallel parking? Is it perpendicular parking? Or is it maybe angled? Now, in some cases, drivers can manually input the type of parking that it is, and it allows the car to bypass the detection systems. So, all in all, I think that the decision to test this particular feature in a very atypical location, why didn't she just go to a regular parking spot, right? That raises questions about the intent behind the test. It appears as though this test was designed by Ms. Yun to fail. But again, you, the viewer, has to make your own conclusions. Let me know in the comments what you think. Now, on a petty note, <laughs> the inconsistency in blurring license plates. Yeah, blurring the American license plates at the beginning of the video when they show a Tesla, but not the Chinese ones when she's parking. That bothers me a bit because... Aren't Chinese citizens also deserving of privacy, like American people? 
I don't know, just a petty note. Um, there is, however, one thing that I agree with the whole, the whole video. Uh, it didn't come from Ms. Yoon. It came from one of their experts that they brought onto the show. Can they duplicate in different languages, in different cultures, a comparably high level of enjoyment? I do believe that integrating different languages and cultures into the many features and the functions of these cars will remain a challenge going forward. At this point, on 2024, August, my Nomi assistant cannot talk to me in English. I cannot talk to her in English. She cannot talk to me in English. Um, also, the app in my iPhone or my Apple Watch. I can actually control my car from my Apple Watch, but still in Chinese. I, I, I don't understand. These cars are already sold in Europe. So why aren't these options available to Chinese consumers, many of whom are, well, not many, but at least a few are foreigners? In fact, I would say that they could benefit from feedback from us if there are glitches or mistranslations or whatever. So again, I don't understand it. So this video, um, if I were to call it a heat piece, ends with Miss Yoon stating that ultimately consumers will decide which automaker is ahead in this competitive race. The day it's going to be the consumers who decide who's really going to be ahead. This is grossly disingenuous and extremely misleading because we all know that the U.S. government's 100% tariff on Chinese EVs is significantly influencing the market even before the consumer has a chance to make a choice. So there you go, friends. Thank you so much for watching this video. See you next time. If you like this kind of topics and this kind of content, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit the bell button as well to be notified whenever there is a new video out. And until I see you again, take it easy and bye for now.